Section 14 of Great Ghost Stories by Joseph Lewis French. Section 14. The Mysterious Sketch, Part 2. The surprising way in which Van Sprechdal had appeared to me threw me into deep wonderment. Yesterday, I said to myself, as I contemplated the pile of ducats glittering in the sun, yesterday I formed the wicked intention of cutting my throat, all for the want of a few miserable florins, and now today fortune has showered them from the clouds. Indeed, it was fortunate that I did not open my razor, and, if the same temptation ever comes to me again, I will take care to wait until the morrow. After making these judicious reflections, I sat down to finish the sketch. Four strokes of the pencil, and it would be finished. But here an incomprehensible difficulty awaited me. It was impossible for me to take those four sweeps of the pencil. I had lost the thread of my inspiration, and the mysterious personage no longer stood out in my brain. I tried in vain to evoke him, to sketch him, and to recover him. He no more accorded with the surroundings than with a figure by Raphael in a ten years in kitchen. I broke out into a profuse perspiration. At this moment, Rapp opened the door without knocking, according to his praiseworthy custom. His eyes fell upon my pile of ducats, and in a shrill voice he cried, "Eh, eh! so I catch you. Will you still persist in telling me, Mr. Painter, that you have no money? and his hooked fingers advanced with that nervous trembling that the sight of gold always produces in a miser. For a few seconds I was stupefied. The memory of all the indignities that this individual had inflicted upon me, his covetous look, and his impudent smile exasperated me. With a single bound I caught hold of him, and pushed him out of the room, slamming the door in his face. This was done with the crack and rapidity of a spring snuff-box. But from outside the old usurer screamed like an eagle, "'My money, you thief! My money!' The lodgers came out of their rooms, asking, "'What is the matter? What has happened?' I opened the door suddenly and quickly gave Mr. Rapp a kick in the spine that sent him rolling down more than twenty steps. "'That's what's the matter,' I cried, quite beside myself. Then I shut the door and bolted it, while bursts of laughter from the neighbors greeted Mr. Rapp in the passage. I was satisfied with myself. I rubbed my hands together." This adventure had put new life into me. I resumed my work and was about to finish the sketch when I heard an unusual noise. Butts of muskets were grounded on the pavement. I looked out of my window and saw three soldiers in full uniform with grounded arms in front of my door. I said to myself in my terror, can it be that that scoundrel of a rap has had any bones broken? And here is the strange peculiarity of the human mind. I, who the night before had wanted to cut my own throat, shook from head to foot, thinking that I might well be hanged if rap were dead. The stairway was filled with confused noises. It was an ascending flood of heavy footsteps, clanking arms, and short syllables. Suddenly somebody tried to open my door. It was shut. Then there was a general clamor. In the name of the law, open! I arose, trembling and weak in the knees. Open! the same voice repeated. I thought to escape over the roofs, 
but I had hardly put my head out of the little snuff-box window when I drew back, seized with vertigo. I saw in a flash all the windows below with their shining panes, their flower-pots, their bird-cages, and their gratings. Lower, the balcony. Still lower, the street-lamp. Still lower again, the sign of the red cask framed in ironwork, and finally three glittering bayonets, only awaiting my fall to run me through the body from the sole of my foot to the crown of my head. On the roof of the opposite house, a tortoise-shell cat was crouching behind a chimney, watching a band of sparrows fighting and scolding in the gutter. One cannot imagine to what clearness, intensity, and rapidity the human eye acquires when stimulated by fear. At the third summons I heard, Open, or we shall force it. Seeing that flight was impossible, I staggered to the door and drew the bolt. Two hands immediately fell upon my collar. A dumpy little man, smelling of wine, said, I arrest you. He wore a bottle-green redingote, buttoned to the chin, and a stove-pipe hat. He had large brown whiskers, rings on every finger, and was named Passoff. He was the chief of police. Five bulldogs with flat caps, noses like pistols, and lower jaws turning upward, observed me from outside. "'What do you want?' I asked Passoff. "'Come downstairs,' he cried roughly, as he gave a sign to one of his men to seize me. This man took hold of me, more dead than alive, while several other men turned my room upside down. I went downstairs, supported by the arms like a person in the last stages of consumption, with hair disheveled and stumbling at every step. They thrust me into a cab between two strong fellows, who charitably let me see the ends of their clubs, held to their wrists by a leather string, and then the carriage started off. I heard behind us the feet of all the urchins of the town. "'What have I done?' I asked one of my keepers. He looked at the other one with a strange smile and said, "'Hans, he asks what he has done.' That smile froze my blood. Soon a deep shadow enveloped the carriage. The horse's hoofs resounded under an archway. We were entering the Raspal house. Of this place, one might say, Don set on. Je vois phobia comme l'une entrée, et ne vois point comme une en sort. All is not rose colored in this world, from the claws of rap. I fell into a dungeon, from which very few poor devils have a chance to escape. Large dark courtyards and rows of windows like a hospital, and furnished with gratings, not a spring of verdure, not a festoon of ivy, not even a weathercock in perspective. Such was my new lodging. It was enough to make one tear his hair out by the roots. The police officers, accompanied by the jailer, took me temporarily to a lock-up. The jailer, if I remember rightly, was named Caspar Schlussel, with his grey woolen cap, his pipe between his teeth, and his bunch of keys at his belt. He reminded me of the owl god of the Caribs. He had the same golden-yellow eyes that see in the dark a nose like a comma, and a neck that was sunk between the shoulders. Schlussel shut me up as calmly as one locks up his socks in a cupboard while thinking of something else. As for me, 
I stood for more than ten minutes with my hands behind my back and my head bowed. At the end of that time, I made the following reflection. When falling, Rapp cried out, I am assassinated. But he did not say by whom. I will say it was my neighbor, the old merchant with the spectacles. He will be hanged in my place. This idea comforted my heart, and I drew a long breath. Then I looked about my prison. It seemed to have been newly whitewashed, and the walls were bare of designs, except in one corner where a gallows had been crudely sketched by my predecessor. The light was admitted through a bull's-eye about nine or ten feet from the floor. The furniture consisted of a bundle of straw and a tub. I sat down upon the straw with my hands around my knees in deep despondency. It was with great difficulty that I could think clearly but suddenly imagining that Rapp, before dying, had denounced me, my legs began to tingle, and I jumped up coughing, as if the hemp and cord were already tightening around my neck. At the same moment I heard Schlussel walking down the corridor. He opened the lock-up and told me to follow him. He was still accompanied by the two officers, so I fell into step, resolutely. We walked down long galleries, lighted at intervals by small windows from within. Behind a grating I saw the famous Jick-Jack, who was going to be executed on the morrow. He had on a straight jacket, and sang out in a raucous voice, Je suis le roi du Cé-Montagne. Seeing me, he called out, Hey, comrade, I'll keep a place for you at my right. The two police officers and the owl god looked at each other and smiled, while I felt the goose flesh creep down the whole length of my back. End of section 14. The Mysterious Sketch, Part 2. Please subscribe to update new videos. Please share and like if you enjoyed the video thanks so much.